to become one of the greatest traders. We have received three, two, one, go. And welcome to another season of History. Now, we have a special guest this season. He has been in this world for a long time. Lived through all the good and the bad times. He's travelled all across the globe and has gone on to become one of the greatest traders. We have received an immense number of requests to have him on board for an interview. Right? All right. So, without further ado, please welcome the one and only known immortal, Mr. Gila. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I must say, having lived as long as I have, I have a lot of stories to share with you. But all of this attention uh, does not sit well with me, sorry. This might be your only chance to ask me questions, so please make use of that opportunity. Perfect. That's what we're all here for. The one and only chance to speak to the only model in existence. Right? Let's take a seat, please. Comfortable? Good to go? All right. Now, we've got lots and lots of questions that have come in from our audience. So, let's get to the most popular one that's on everyone's minds. Right? How did you become immortal? Well, uh, all I can say is that a certain apple from a certain nose tree fell and that is how everything began. <laughs> That is right. Um, when I when I got to a particular age, the age that you see right now, everything changed. Everything changed except me. I've I've seen some of the brightest of the bright days, uh, some of the darkest of the dark days. Wow. I have I have seen everything, and I've seen nothing. I've. I've lived through the ages of the traders, the kings, the pilgrims. How lovely. So, with all this time in your hand, you must have traveled far and wide to, I think, almost every place imaginable, right? So, which is your favorite place? Oh, oh, that's hard. Italy. That's nice. Uh, ac actually, no, no, no. I, I, I think it'll be Cape Town. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so no, Cape no, I... <laughs> I might have to go with you West Bengal. <laughs> yeah, right. See, I've had so many experiences and with in so many places around the world, it's it's really hard for me to choose one as my most favorite, you know. Wow. I wish I could say the same about myself. Yeah. So with all this traveling, you've seasoned yourself to be one of the greatest traders of all times. Trade. So how did it all start? Actually, uh, trade existed long before even I was born. Uh, long distance trade would have started somewhere, if, if I recall right, around the 3000 BC or so. Uh, Mesopotamia and, oh, and the Indus Valley Civilization. You know, these were the two biggest civilizations in the entire world at this time. And both of them needed a lot of stuff. So they traded a lot. I think that was the first big instance of trade. Now these guys traded expensive items like spices, textile, precious metals. 
as time passed, uh, ships and caravans carrying traders moved all around the world. Trading was an amazing idea. We were suddenly able to get rid of stuff that we had in surplus or in excess. And some of the stuff that we could never have had by ourselves, we could get that now. It was a way to progress, if you ask me. Like the town I was born in. We always had an excess of cotton, but barely any spices. And we started to trade cotton to get our hands on some spices. Now the thing is that uh, trade of goods along the sea routes actually happened much faster than that on land. And an added advantage to the coastal regions was that they even produced the raw materials required for these goods. Soon the whole idea of trade was celebrated and coastal regions started to flourish. Now, here in India, the presence of a long coastline and an abundance of raw materials worked in favor of India when it came to trade. South India, being famous for gold, pepper and precious stones, it caught the eye of many foreign traders. And you know, it led to something I'd like to call the, the pepper affair. <laughs> One minute, do you mean the spice trade? Are you talking about that? So what you choose to call it, then yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Now, let me explain what he's talking about. Wait a minute. Choose the item that were traded among silk, metals, Gold, pepper, well done, that was great. Long distance trade was faster by sea route than the land route. So, We had everything, precious stone and gold in the Himalayas, sandalwood in the western hills, the pearls of the southern seas, corals from the eastern oceans, spices in South India and so on. South India was famous for gold, precious stone and spices, especially pepper. There was this one empire that really liked the pepper from there more than anyone else did. The Romans. The Roman Empire looked at pepper like gold. They even called it black gold. Traders shipped pepper overseas and transported it across the land with caravans all the way to Rome. In return, the Romans traded with a bunch of gold coins which you can still find in South India along the Malabar coast and in Chennai. They had a nice happy trade going. Ayyo, this land is full of big rocks. Honey, I think we have hit the jackpot. Yep, this confirms it. These are Roman gold coins. But it was not just the Romans. Traders from all around the globe came to trade with India. From Rome, Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, you name it. The more they traded, the more they started exploring the vast oceans. People started figuring out new sea routes and coastal lines to trade through. But even then, trade took time. Look at how far Egypt is from Sri Lanka. It used to take traders days, maybe even weeks to trade goods between these places. Sometimes... I'm sorry, there was, there was some really hard times. I mean, the, the treasures... Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> The trader had to somehow overcome this obstacle of time. That is when they figured out how to use the monsoon winds.
actually fit. The traders actually studied the weak patterns and soon trading became very organized and professional. Okay, let's pick a route, okay? Kochi over here and Egypt over here. Pepper has to move all this way. Traveling all the way from Kochi to Egypt along the coast was a tedious task. It often took traders months before they got to their destination. And another few months to get back home. All of this changed when Hippolys discovered the use of the monsoon winds. Suddenly, it was as if a new shuttle service had been introduced. A, a direct route across the ocean. The journeys were shorter. The ships sailing from over here to India could just wait for the next pickup. And right on time. West monsoon winds would pick them up and shuttle them across double quick to arrive in India. They can then complete their trades and other businesses here and get ready for the return pickup scheduled about six months later. The returning northeast monsoon shuttle in the winter would bring the ships back. All they had to do reach the shuttle stations on time and trade suddenly became super predictable and precise. Traders from East Africa and Arabia soon learned this trick and took advantage of the monsoon winds to cross the seas quickly. All this meant more trade of course. Like I said, India was a really busy hub for trading at the time. I like that you're calling it the Pepper Affair, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, this exciting story is just getting started. We'll be right back after a small break. of India to the Arabian Sea, Southwest Monsoon, Southeast Monsoon, Northwest Monsoon, Northeast Monsoon. Correct order is South East, oops, Southeast Monsoon, oops, Southwest Monsoon Who 
joined in a little bit late today, we have Mr. Gila, the immortal, to share his stories with us. Now, there's a guy out in the audience who has a very interesting question for you. I'm going to read it to you. Oh. Mr. Gila, you said that trade was blooming and that coastal cities in India were rising. Did you visit any of these coastal cities? And how was life there? continent has this beautiful long coastline full of hills, plateaus and river valleys. And this is where you farmers said. grew their crops, which happened to be very good by the way. The river valleys were extremely fertile and they had all sorts of guys we are back uh my robo was uh Ping, attention, good, well, and he was mad. Okay, we have started uh, the lesson. New lesson. Innovative new techniques. Lesson. Topic. The kings that ruled over these rich coastlines demanded that the people give them gifts as well as money. Also, the farmers in these regions ended up paying lots of tax. They paid these taxes not just in cash, but they gave a part of their produce of wheat or rice as taxes. For example, supposing they grew 6 kgs of wheat, they had to give one whole kg as tax. That's one sixth of what they grew. Okay. More trade led to dash taxes, uh, tax collection. More, small, less, no. More is a correct answer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Advantage of the coast. You see what's happening here, right? People were being taxed for trade and for the crops being produced. Making the coastal regions the prime spot to collect large amounts of tax money. All the powerful chiefs and kings wanted to control the coastal trade towns for all the easy tax money. While the kings of the north were moving to the south to gain control over the coastal kingdoms, all these powerful coastal kingdoms were themselves expanding over the seas to present day Sri Lanka, Andaman and Nicobar, and even as far as Malaysia. Power and money were everything to these kingdoms, and these guys went to great lengths to have them all. Kingdoms were flourishing and the citizens continued to grow rich. Poetry and art became popular. All kinds of praises about the rich kings were being written in the form of poetry, stories, some sort of a literature called the Sangam literature. Next. To the factor that made coastal coasts important for trade, fertile land, proximity uh, to the sea, abundance of gold reserves, no taxation. Okay. Uh, I think this is a answer. No, do only. Okay. Ah, that is correct. Li uh, that was a lightning fast, no? Sangam literature is an ancient set of Tamil texts that speak about the history of ancient southern India. The 
Sangam poems praised the kings of that time, primarily the three chiefs of the ruling families in the south. These families were the Cholas, the Chetas, and the Pandyas. Together, they were called Movendar, the Tamil word for three chiefs. About 2,300 years ago, these were three prominent kingdoms in the south. These three kingdoms wanted to have it all. They wanted to become the most powerful. So, they set out to the southeastern and the southwestern coasts and established their centers. Each of these three chiefs had a center of power near the coast as well as one inland. This also helped them maintain proper administration over their vast empires. Making it a total of six cities, out of which two were very important. The first one being the coastal city of the Cholas, known as Pohar. Actually, now, this, uh, uh, this, this place was also known as Kaveri Patnam. Because the Cholas were believed to have come from the fertile land around the river Kaveri. The other important city was Madurai, the capital of the Pandyas. The Cheras had also set up base in interior Tamil Nadu. It was called Karu. From these cities, the chiefs even went on military expeditions to the neighboring areas and collected tributes. So, taxes, gifts, tributes, that's a lot of wealth flowing into the hands of the rulers, isn't it? Hey, come on now. Uh, they weren't all that bad people. They were kind to their people. In fact, they would keep some of their earnings and distribute some of their wealth with their families, their armies, soldiers, and even poets. Oh, yes, the poets. Right. So, the poets composed poems in praise of the chiefs who rewarded them. Now, what did they get for all this praise? But I must tell you, I was a poet for a while too. Really? And for our masterful flattery, my beautiful lady, we would not just get gold and clothing. We used to even get uh, horses. Uh, get to the uh, and main topic is there that we uh, get to the Hindi. Or baki ki wealth distribute karte the apne paribar. अपनी आर्मी सोल्जर्स और यहाँ तक कि पोइट्स के साथ भी ओ हाँ द पोइट्स राइट तो पोइट्स जो पोएम लिखते उनमें चीफ्स के प्रेजेस होते जो उन्हें रिवॉर्ड करते पर उन्हें इन प्रेज के बदले क्या मिलता वेल मुझे आपको बताना चाहिए कि मैं भी कुछ समय के लिए पोइट था सच में हमारी मास्टरफुल फ्लैटरी के लिए माय ब्यूटीफुल लेडी हमें सिर्फ गोल्ड और क्लोथ्स नहीं मिलते हमें हॉर्सेस एलिफेंट्स और चैरियट्स भी मिलते थे और ओ मुझे याद है एक बार मुझे एक्चुअली एक महल गिफ्ट में दिया गया था नो वंडर पोएट सिर्फ रूलर्स की प्रेजेस पर ही पोएम्स लिखते थे तो अब हमें पता है द चोलास चेरास और द पंडियास ने सदन कोस को बहुत लंबे टाइम तक रूल किया बट अब चीजें बदल रही थी अराउंड 200 हंड्रेड ईयर्स लेटर कुछ ऐसा हुआ कंट्री के वेस्टर्न पार्ट में जिसे साउथ के ये थ्री किंग्स काफी अफेक्ट हुए चलिए देखते हैं मैच द फॉलोइंग किंगडम्स एंड प्लेसेस देयर सेंटर आइसलैंड कोस्टल और अल्टरनेटिव नेम्स ओके करूर वॉज इन दैट्स या करूर वॉज इन द छोला आई थिंक एंड कोरकाई उप्स द स्क्रीन इज वेरी वाट इज Why? Sangam. Okay. 
Karoor was in the Chola. Hi, <laughs> Cholas. I Ra Yura Yur was in the Puhar. I am not a, not very yeah. yeah it was all was wrong okay then the correct answer is cholas yara yara yur puhar kave kaveri patnam cherries kurar and pandeyas korkai okay next कुछ 2000 years पहले एक dynasty थी जिसका नाम था सातवाहना dynasty वो western India में powerful बनी दूसरे dynasties की तरह ये भी expand होना चाहते थे और guess कीजिए उन्हें क्या जीतना था exactly the south गौतमी पुत्र श्री सत्तकर्णी सातवाहनास के एक prominent ruler थे और वो rule करना चाहते थे south के इन rich और fertile lands को उन्होंने अपनी army भेजी चोलास, चेहरास और पांडियास के kingdoms को conquer करने के लिए गौतमी पुत्र और सातवाहनास के दूसरे rulers को कहा जाता था lords of दक्षिण पत दक्षिण मतलब south और पत का मतलब होता है पात दक्षिण पता ने साउथ के साथ ट्रेड करने का रास्ता बनाया आ, तो आप जानती हैं गौतमी पुत्रा एक्चुअली मां का लाडला था इनफैक्ट जो कुछ भी हम उनके बारे में जानते हैं जो भी आप शेयर कर रही हैं यह हमें केवल गौतमी बालाश्री जो उनकी मां थी उनके द्वारा लिखे गए लिटरेचर और इंस्क्रिप्शंस की वजह से ही पता चला है सातवाहनास ने साउथ के रिचेस एंजॉय तो किए ठीक है पर ऐसा बहुत टाइम तक नहीं चला द चोला डायनेस्टी ने फिर से पावर हासिल किया और जो राइटफुली उनका था उसे वापस लिया और उन्होंने कोस को प्रॉस्पेरिटी से रूल किया खत्म ओके आई वाज ओके सत्यवाना इमर्ज अराउंड द टाइम डैश इयर्स आफ्टर म्यू <laughs> it is very uh, difficult words move in the okay to add it is b 200 and select and it is correct okay you were a quick as arrow okay thank you recap some Murray. साउथ इंडिया एक इंपॉर्टेंट स्पॉट था पूरे वर्ल्ड से आए हुए मर्चेंट्स के लिए और जल्द ही डिफरेंट बिजनेसेस और प्रोफेशंस बने इन कोस्ट के आसपास किंग्स को इन कोस्टल ट्रेड टाउन्स पर कंट्रोल करना था और ये करने से वो बहुत रिच बने उन्हें मिले ट्रिब्यूट्स और टैक्सेस की वजह से साउथ में थ्री पावरफुल किंगडम्स से द चोलास द चेरास और द पांडियास ये किंगडम्स एक्सपैंड हुए श्रीलंका अंडमान एंड निकोबार आइलैंड्स और साउथ ईस्ट एशिया के कुछ पार्ट्स में सातवाहनास ने ट्रेड के लिए वेस्ट इन इंडिया से रास्ता बनाया साउथ तक और उसे कहा दक्षिण पत ओके वेट मिन गाइस नेक्स्ट जर्नी ऑफ आवर लेट्स जनरी 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 इज स्टोरी ऑफ सिल्क एंड आवर चैप्टर नेम ट्रेडर स्किंग्स एंड पिलग्रिया ग्रीम्स ओके फर्स्ट इज योर टॉपिक बुद्धिज्म
अरे रुको ऐसा मत करो वो इरिटेट हो जाएगा ये ऐसे काम नहीं करता बुद्धिज्म में सिर्फ पीस है इरिटेशन मेरे दिमाग का आखिरी ख्याल होगा अगर आप माइंड ना करें मुझे लगता है हमें आगे बढ़ना चाहिए और बोनस सेगमेंट करना चाहिए मुझे लगता है फैशन पिलग्रम स्टोरी करने तक इनका हो जाएगा और फिर हम कंटिन्यू कर लेंगे ओके देन तो चलो शुरू करते हैं ओके कैन वी लाइट इन इंग्लिश ओके कैमरा वेलकम टू हिस्टोरी इट्स वी कैन डू इट इंग्लिश वन अगेन is all about peace meditation is the last thing on my mind and if you don't mind i think we should go ahead and do a little bonus segment yeah i think he'll be done in time for the fashion pilgrim story and we can continue okay then let's start rolling okay lights camera action Where we are in conversation with the one and only immortal Mr. Gillow. Now, before we continue with our little interview, let us go through a little story about the Buddhism that was prevalent in India. Over 2,000 years ago, the Kushanas ruled and controlled Central Asia and Northwest India. Around a hundred years into their rule, our next chapter in 127 BCE. Time. Our next uh, two chapters will be the buddhi the new ideas of the history new ideas and questions of history and uh, Ash- uh, the empire uh, the ashoka empire who give up a war and third was third is of geography uh, geography the um, uh, last chapter okay uh, i will tell uh, in another session okay bye means oh, why not uh, listen kanishka was born the most famous ruler of the kushanas he was famous for his political military and spiritual accomplishments his conquests and support of buddhism played an important role in the spread of buddhism by the silk route this is because Kanishka did not just believe in Buddhism and practice it but he also encouraged its teachings Kanishka could not carry forward his teachings alone and needed advisors so he organized a little Buddhist team a Buddhist council where scholars met and discussed important matters they started writing about the achievements and teachings in Sanskrit Kanishka was the head of the council but it was run by someone who knew the teachings and the ideas behind Buddha Ashvaghosha Ashvaghosha was a poet and he composed the Buddha Charita a biography of Buddha Ashwagosa was a head of Buddhist council created by Kanishka. It was up that ow. Okay. Aap ki bane ki bane video is there okay? A new form of Buddhism known as Mahayana Buddhism was developed. This happened during Kanishka's rule and it spread through the silk route. This new form of Buddhism had two distinct features: statues and bodhisattvas. Yeah, Buddhism existed, sure. But the people needed something to associate Buddha with. Mm, some sort of sign maybe? Mm, a coin? A tree? A statue? Before Mahayana Buddhism, Buddha's 
presence was shown by the sculptures of the peepal tree. The peepal tree was a sign of Buddha attaining enlightenment. In the entrance of Mahayana Buddhism, statues of Buddha were made. The statues that came into being through Mahayana Buddhism had exaggerated features like long earlobes, thick lips, wide eyes and a prominent nose. Many of the statues were made in Mathura and some in Takshila. You can notice the similarities here. The same Takshila is known the as the Takshashila also in the Marathi language. Maharan, Mahayana Buddhist statue. Premodern nose. No clothes. Oops. <coughs> Big hands. Thick lips. Hairs are there. Our points. Okay. Spread of Buddhism. Hey there. Ready to continue with our little interview? Yes. Yes, please. Bring it on, bring it on. I'm sorry about that. Good to meet you, please, speaking about it. Bodhisattvas. Ah, yes, the Bodhisattvas. <coughs> Bodhisattvas, these, these were people who were meant to be in isolation in their pursuit of knowledge. Uh, but they chose to help others. So instead of uh, going to a cave, living in by themselves in isolation and praying for their nirvana, they chose to stay back and teach, help others in their enlightenment journey. Uh, this, was, this was a very interesting concept. This was very impactful in society back then. For the first time, common man had access to the spiritual teachings that was earlier reserved for the priests and the monks. Wow. Can you read yeah. that People language? took to this idea so strong that they would actually worship the bodhisattvas. And that I'm a little... Uh, yeah. But then the, the concept really picked pace. It grew, uh, it, it spread wide, it became really famous. Um, in fact, it, it, it spread throughout Central Asia and China. And of course, with booming trade and the expansion of the Silk Route, this idea of Bodhisattvas also spread all the way over to Korea and Japan. Wow. Apart from this, I know that Buddhism itself spread to Western and Southern India. Buddhist monks used to reside in caves. They must have been at a whole new level of peace to be living inside a cave. This is the last there studio, quite guys. a number of caves, right? Yes, and I've lived in a few caves myself, really? going from cave to cave. Wow. Some of the most peaceful experiences. It was like Mother Nature had given us homes to live in. The nights were remarkable. We would look up. A breath of fresh air and the stars in the sky would actually speak stories with us. I can imagine. Well, uh, mountains, hills would be hollowed out for all of these caves, like in the western ghats and other places. Because none of this would have been possible. What? Oh. Mm. I said no, this is the last. <laughs>